Um, those of you that are here, let's sing a while.
says even though I don't deserve to live we get so caught up in this life sometimes and we think everybody owes us something we think the Lord owes us something but really what we deserve is hell what we deserve is to be dead what we deserve is nothing that the Lord has blessed us with I don't deserve to be here this morning I don't deserve to have a family that raised me in church I don't deserve anything I've got and sometimes we need to remember that, that it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. I'm thankful for what he's blessed me with this morning. Would there be somebody with a word on your heart? Something you want to say or do at this time? Anything at all? all right, okay. Y'all grab your Bibles, turn to the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, boy, I'm thankful for the grace of God, brother Zach. Brother Zach Berry is exactly right when he said, "What we deserve is to be in hell." You say, "But brother Caleb, the Lord uh, wouldn't do that to us." Well, you're right; He wouldn't, but He'd be justified if He did. Amen. It's called the mercy of God, right. and uh, and if it hadn't been for His mercy which are new every morning, which are endless, which will he'll never run out on. Amen. Uh, if it hadn't been for his mercy, uh, we would all die lost and go to a devil's hell. Right. And uh, some of us have never come uh, to a full understanding of that, and it's because of that where we're not affected by the, the, the wonderful, uh, wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let me, let me just make a statement about being saved. When you get saved, when you get born again, you're no longer the same person. Can I, can I just be real honest? If your salvation didn't complete and totally change who you are, then there's something wrong somewhere. Amen. And uh, I, I still believe in what the Bible said that when it said that we're a new creature. Amen. And the change that that makes in a, in a person's life and how... They're no longer the same, they're different, and they're, they're, they're better. Let me make that statement as well. They're, they're better off, amen. And uh, when I got saved, uh, the Lord made me fully aware of what I deserved uh, if it had not been for the grace that was bestowed for me to be born again, amen. 
And in order to help you, if the Lord Jesus has changed your life, amen, this past week's been a tough one. It's been a tough week, amen, been a tough week, been tough for a lot of Americans, been tough for a lot of people today across the entire world. It's, this thing's not going to get better the closer we get to his return. Do y'all understand me? Do y'all under, how many of you understand me when I say that this thing of, of life and existence as a world, as a culture, as a society, everything will get worse out there the closer we get to the rapture, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, well, that sounds real pessimistic, Brother Caleb. No, that's prophetic, friend. Amen. I'm not telling you something to bring you down. I'm telling you something to lift you up. You say, why? Because for the believer, for the child of God that's in here today, it's not supposed to get worse for you. Amen. You say, well, I ain't making as much money or I ain't got as much much comfort out in this world. That's not what I'm talking about as a believer. I'm talking about what's going on on the inside of you. The Bible calls it the blessed hope of His glorious appearing. And for the child of God that knows He's coming back, it ought to do something inside of them. It ought to help them to know we're closer than we've ever been to the return of our Savior. And that's a real thing today. I said it's a real thing today. He's coming back, friend. And that ought to help you, man. That ought to bless you. That ought to encourage you. It ought to do something inside of you to know that this thing ain't over, friend. It's getting worse out there. It's unbelievably worse out there. And things are happening, and they're trying to take away freedom, and they're trying to get one look here one step closer to being able to say, you have to do exactly what we say or we'll kill you. Do you understand? Do you understand that's what's coming? What, you say, what do you, what's coming is this. You either do what we say or we're going to murder you. Amen. That's, that's what they're headed towards. You do what we say or you're going to get on your knees and we're just going to kill you. Okay? Amen. And as, hey, and as a, as a believer, we must be aware of these things. Now that don't mean we shouldn't stand up. But that when we stand, we should stand up knowing what's coming. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm fired up about what's real today. And what's, what's truth today. What we hold in our hand today is truth. Amen. It's more true than what we're seeing on TV, what we're seeing on our Facebook what we're seeing on anything and everything that's being produced by a secular, wicked, and ungodly, an evil world. It's an evil world. And it's getting worse and worse. And people are losing their lives. I watched a video of two deputy sheriffs that had apprehended some folk, and they were speeding. And in the back seat of a vehicle was an individual with a two-year-old baby. And the police officer asked him to get out, and he got out with an assault weapon and open fire on two deputies with a baby right there beside of him. And I watched him lose his life to two police officers. And by the grace of God, that baby was safe. There was two other people in the vehicle that escaped and came back to the police officers and showed some integrity in my opinion. Amen. Two police officers, one was severely injured but lived to tell about it. And the other one didn't have a scratch. So what's that? What are you trying to get at? As evil as this world is, God's still good. Amen. And what are we going to do about it? We're going to keep living right. Keep preaching right. Keep preaching truth. It's going to get worse out there, but it don't have to get worse in here. Well, I'm thankful for a merciful and wonderful God. I want to read to you what the Bible says. I believe it will be a blessing to you. Look at chapter 7, book of Hebrews. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. (laughs) Remember something. This book is supernatural. Remember something. This book is is, uh, extraordinary. Amen. It's quick. And this morning, as the preacher of the service I have no other desire than to give you what thus saith the word of God. And if you'll let the word of God speak to you, it will help you. 
Look at verse 22. The Bible says, if you're there, say amen. <clears throat> By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. I preached through the book of Hebrews one time, just picking out where it talks about how that Jesus is better. Amen. And he is better. He's greater than anything. Amen. It doesn't matter what you put in there and fill in the blank with. He's greater. Verse 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. This is a wonderful passage of scripture that we've just read today. And what it's describing is it's describing how that Jesus is a better high priest. And how that his priesthood supersedes every single other priesthood that's ever existed. But this morning, I don't want to keep you forever. And I want to try to give you what God's laid on my heart in regards to what he calls here in verse 25. Where it says he is able to save them to the uttermost. The uttermost. I began to look at this verse of scripture and I began to ask the Lord to speak to me through it and by it. And the Lord started helping me and showing me some other passages that goes hand in hand with the truth and, and, and doctrine in regards to being saved to the uttermost. And so this morning I want to preach on this thought of being saved to the uttermost. When you look up this word, Uttermost. You know what you'll find is you'll find that it's describing the greatest achievement, if you will, uh, that can be attained. In, in regards to salvation, what I believe the writer here to be Apostle Paul, and so if I refer to it as Paul, please understand that's what I believe. And that's what I believe he's saying. Is I believe when he says that he is able to save them to the uttermost, what he's saying is, is he's saying, I believe God is able to save them to the greatest capacity that's possible to be achieved. Do you understand? He's saying that they are being saved to the highest degree, uh, to the uttermost extent. He's describing their salvation as being entire and final. Let me make that statement again. That's a blessing to me this morning. He's saying their salvation is entire and it's final. Boy, that's a blessing today. It's holy and it's truly for those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul here, I believe, is describing the fact that the priesthood of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he gives to those that have sinned is an entire salvation. It's a full salvation. It's a complete salvation. I believe it's a perfect salvation. Somebody help me right there. What I'm saying is, is even though I ain't perfect, and even though this flesh of mine, this vessel of mine is sorry and low down, hey, I'm thankful that there's something inside of me that is perfect, that is final, that is to the fullest extent the greatest that can be possibly achieved by mankind. And that comes through and by salvation. This salvation has a man. Amen. This salvation has a man, a specific man, a specific name. And his name is what? It's Jesus Christ. There's no other name. I'm just not going to bow my knee to the ecumenical ideology that says it doesn't matter who you call on. It doesn't matter what religion, if you will, you ascribe to. That's a bold-faced and lie straight out of the pits of hell today. And we need some people to remember and believe that in this verse where it says he is able, that's not talking.
talking about any other than Jesus Christ. He, the man, there's a man of our salvation, and that man's name is Jesus. Amen. Not only does this salvation have a man, this salvation has a plan. This plan is through and by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ was given so that we might be saved thereby. Apostle Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And if you'll put your faith and trust in what Jesus did, the Bible tells us, having called on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Amen. You will be saved. Amen. I'm not talking about a maybe. It's no care. If you're not taking a risk here. I'm not talking about something that if you beg your way through, you'll get it. Listen, hey, if you come to a realization of what you are, hey, if you come to a place of knowledge and understanding that if you die lost in your sins, you'll split hell wide open. According to that King James Bible right there, if you put your faith in Jesus, Christ's gospel, the good news that he came, that he died, that he was buried, and praise be to God that he resurrected, that he ever liveth, make an intercession for you and I. If you'll put your faith in that truth, and that truth alone, according to the scriptures, you will be saved. It's a no-so salvation. John said over there in the book of 1 John chapter 5, that if you put your faith in his name, that you can know that you're saved. This salvation has a man. This salvation has a plan. This salvation has a span, a spectrum. You say, what do you mean? Whosoever will. Amen. Well, I'm thankful. For, <laughs> hey, I'm thankful today that I didn't qualify for anything else in this life. I don't qualify for much, but I qualified, praise be to God, as a seven-year-old boy, there on 1820 Gay Perkins Road, where I was born and raised, I got under a heavy, I'm talking about a heavy dose of conviction. And I come one-on-one -on -one with eternity thinking to myself that I was about to die there as a seven-year-old boy. And the Lord started dealing with me. And God himself started revealing to me that I was lost and in need to be saved. And there, as a seven-year-old boy, I got down on my face before an almighty God. Hey, and I called on heaven, and I called on Jesus. And guess what? That day, that hour, that moment, when I called on the Lord Jesus Christ, I qualified, praise be to God. Hey, I qualified for a whosoever will salvation. And I got to call on the name of Jesus Christ. And the span of his salvation was sufficient for a seven-year-old nobody in the middle of nowhere that should have died and went to hell if it hadn't been for the grace of an almighty God. I'm talking about being saved to the uttermost. I'm talking about being saved to the uttermost. I'm not talking about a halfway salvation. I'm not talking about, look here, hey, it's preaching time. I'm not talking about one of these salvations where you tell everybody you say, but you're living in direct sin and rebellion to God's word without any, any conviction. I'm not talking about a salvation where you're living in straight sin and shame and there's no change. I'm talking about salvation that flips your whole existence upside down. I'm talking about a salvation where you was old and now you are new. Amen. I'm talking about a salvation where you're better off. And look here, and by His grace you know that you deserve to be worse off. Amen. A complete and total change that takes place only through and by the Holy Ghost of God. Something that's real something that's supernatural and supersedes anything that can be manufactured by a man's testimony or experience. Amen? A change. Being, the Bible calls it, regenerated. I'm talking about different, saved to the uttermost. The Bible gives us some reasons. The Bible gives us some areas where we got changed when we got saved to the uttermost. What happened in the life and in the testimony of a believer when they got saved to the uttermost? Flip over with me real quick 
to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, I'm thankful for God's word, amen. You know what this book is? This book's the best commentary on this book. And when we're trying to figure out this, this idea of being saved to the uttermost, guess what the Bible does a real good job of? It does a real good job <coughs> of explaining <coughs> what the uttermost is. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, this is our commission. This is our instruction. This is where God <coughs> has given us the very reason as to why we're still here. If you're here this morning, and you can say without a doubt, Brother Shirley, I know I've been saved, and I know I've been saved to the uttermost. Well, let me just help you with something. This verse right here is the reason that when you got saved, He didn't just take you on home to glory, but He left you here for your life to be lived. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem that was the city Judea that was the country Samaria that was that uh, uh, collection of countries there and unto the uttermost parts of the world or rather the uttermost part of the world you say brother Shirley what do you think this right here is describing to us when you got saved to the uttermost number one you got recruited you got recruited for the uttermost. When you got born again, you got commissioned. You got called into the army of God, if you will. And God has now, therefore, recruited you for the uttermost. You see, here in this verse of Scripture, we see that there is a power that is received. He says, but ye shall, notice, receive power. You shall receive power, but not only is power received, but there's a person that's revealed that delivers this power. You shall receive power, notice, after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. When you got saved, when I got saved, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God sets up an abode, and He takes a dwelling inside of every believer. And and he starts living in and through those that's been born again. And when you and I got born again, the Holy Spirit of God endowed you and I with power, with power, the Bible says, in order to be, the Bible says, a witness. After that you have received, notice, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses. Witnesses. Say, so what's a witness? Somebody that gives testimony about what they know to be true. Amen. <laughs> I'm talking about somebody that, look here, has a testimony about what they know to be truth. This past weekend, Brother Gavin Flatt was preaching, <clears throat> and he was talking about how that when he had first got saved and he first got fired up and he first got excited about being something and doing something for God, hey, he said, I couldn't tell you all the verses of scriptures. He said, I couldn't rattle off all the references to the plan of salvation. He said, I didn't know all the truths and nuances of God's word. He said, but this is what I knowed. I once was blind. And then Jesus saved my soul. He said, and now he changed my life forever. And this is what Brother Gavin Flatt said. He said, back then, he said, it almost seems like I had more power of God in my witness than I do knowing all those things that the Bible says. He said, because I was closer to God and His Holy Spirit was dictating my life at a far greater capacity. Boy, it's a crying shame for the believer. Amen? You want to know why we ain't got no uh, effect on people today? It's because we ain't got no purpose. Because we like the touch of the Holy Spirit on our life. We're not walking in the Spirit. We're not living through and by the power of His Spirit. And because of that, we've got no power in our witness. I said we've got no power <coughs> in our witness. Our ability to reach people. When, they, when you got saved to the uttermost, you want to know what that means? That means you got recruited for the uttermost. There's a world out there of people everywhere. 
and you're crossing their path on a daily basis and they stand in need, they stand in desperate need of somebody to care enough about to tell them the truth of eternity. And most of us would have to be dead to care less. Say amen if it's right. When I got saved to the uttermost, I got recruited for the uttermost. I, power was received, the person was revealed, and people are to be reached. We're to be witnesses unto me, unto me both in Jerusalem, he said, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts part of the earth. God's people needs to be a witness. And if you're saved today, if you're truly born again, then you have been commissioned. You have been recruited for the purpose of taking His truth to everyone. Not only are we recruited for the uttermost, I want you to notice we're rewarded to the uttermost. Flip over to the book of Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Talking about being saved to the uttermost. Talking about how that this term uttermost is found throughout the scriptures. And here in the New Testament we can find what salvation gave to the life of every believer and what he's supposed to be and how this uttermost salvation should do or what it should do to that believer once he's been saved. We're recruited for the uttermost. We're rewarded to the uttermost in Mark chapter 13 and verse 24. The Bible says... But in those days, <clears throat> after that tribulation, we're Bible students, amen church? We're Bible believers. What's he talking about? He's talking about after the seven years of tribulation, between the tribulation and thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself will come back. Do you all know where we are right here in the context of this passage? I want to be a Bible preacher. I don't want to take it out of context. A lot of people apply this to the rapture. This ain't the rapture. This is Armageddon. This is millennial reign. He said in those days after the tribulation, notice the sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. <clears throat> the stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. I like preaching the Bible. I like teaching the Bible. I like knowing what the Bible says. Right here is an important truth. The stars and the powers of heaven is talking about wicked entities that have rule and reign on this planet in this very day and age. Why is the elitist of our world so wicked? Why are they so ungodly? Why are they so depraved? You say, what are you talking about? Look here, y'all, Hollywood is a wicked place. It's not a coincidence that the people in Hollywood are called stars. Movie stars. Because this term of being a star goes hand in hand with wicked entities that rule and reign as the prince of the power of the air dictates them to do so. Do you understand what I'm saying today? It's a wicked and ungodly world and there are powers that be that have, I'm talking about real authority given to them by Satan himself. And they have a throne. One day, glory be to an almighty God. One day, Jesus, the Bible says, is going to come back. And when he shows up, as he shows up, they're going to get knocked out of the sky. <laughs> I don't think we really get a full grasp the spiritual realm that's around us. I stand here today preaching to y'all and I feel like there is a dark wall between me and you. I can't reach you. I can't touch you. I don't know what it is. The harder I preach, the softer I preach, I can't make a lick of difference. What is the reasoning for that? Because we have dark, wicked beings that are affecting every single person that's breathing today. And it's ridiculous. And it's so tough to live in this world and experience the Lord without allowing those things to affect your mind. But you know what's going to happen one day? One glorious day, Jesus himself is going to come back. The moon's going to turn dark or turn to, to blood. The sun's going to be darkened. The stars of heaven, the powers that be, 
that are in the sky, in the heavens. The Bible says they'll be shaken. Notice verse 26. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. There are some, I mean, powerful spiritual beings that be. But there's not one that is, I'm talking about a drop in the bucket as compared to the Son of Man. And He's going to come back. And He's going to walk into that city that He alone, He alone deserves to sit on the throne at. And He's going to sit on that throne and the Bible says He'll rule and reign. And there's not a single entity that will have the ability to withstand His power and His glory on that day. And the Bible says in verse 27, And then shall He send His angels and shall gather together His elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth, notice, to the uttermost part of heaven. Not only is there a recruiter, or rather a recruiting for the uttermost to go out and to tell the uttermost part of the world, but there is a reward towards the uttermost. Hallelujah. And when you got saved, and when I got saved, according to the scriptures, we then therefore was given a right. Listen, we were saved to the uttermost. What's that mean? That means our salvation was final. That means our salvation was complete. That means our salvation was eternal. It was everlasting. That means nobody can take it. Nobody can do anything about it. And it is absolutely and completely forever settled in heaven. And there'll be a day come where glory be to God. We'll be able to cross that river. And we'll get to walk into that place that the Bible calls heaven. And the Bible says that we'll be able to experience the uttermost part of heaven. There's a reward for the believer. And that reward is not only that we get to enjoy this place, this place called earth. Hey, I'm thankful that, that, that we get to enjoy this, this world. I, I enjoy this world. I enjoy getting to go out and enjoy nature and things of that such. But the fact of the matter is, some of us, when we got saved, we were thankful that God saved us from the place called hell. But He didn't just save us from the place called hell. He saved us from the place called earth, friend. And the Bible says that for the believer that we're not to have affection for this place. That, that this place shouldn't rule and dictate the things that we do. We can enjoy it. We can live here. We have to live here. But the Bible tells us that we're to lift up our head and that we're to love and have affection and have intimacy towards that place. Why? Because that place is a real place. It's a glorious place. It's a victorious place. And for every believer today, when we got saved, we got saved to the uttermost. And that uttermost is a place called heaven. And that place is a place where one day we will be reunited. We'll be reunited with those loved ones. I look forward to getting to be able to witness some of the mamas, some of the daddies, that wrap up those babies that they never got to meet. That get to wrap up and hold some of those loved ones that's gone on to be with the Lord. Mamas and daddies, babies and <coughs> children and brothers and sisters being reunited. It will be a glad reunion day. And the only way you get to get in on that day is if you've ever, look here, been saved to the uttermost. Some of us today miss those loved ones. Some of us today know loved ones that walked it, talked it, and was the perfect testimony of being completely and totally changed by the salvation that they received to the uttermost. And they've convinced themselves that one day they'll see them again. But the fact is, and the fact that remains is this, they've not yet been saved to the uttermost. And they, look here, they're claiming a halfway salvation. They're claiming, a, they're claiming some kind of, a, <clears throat> of a, an emotional high that didn't do anything more than give them a good moment to enjoy. But the Lord God never changed them. They never truly put their faith in God. They never received Him as their Savior. And if they died lost, they'd split hell wide open. Why? 
because they've never been saved to the uttermost. And if you've never been saved to the uttermost, don't you dare convince yourself and expect in yourself <laughs> to get to experience that glad reunion day. There's a reward towards the uttermost for those that have been saved to the uttermost. I'm thankful, ain't you? Not only are we recruited for the uttermost, not only are we rewarded towards the uttermost, lastly, we're rescued from the uttermost. One more verse of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians, and I'll be done. And this is where I want to finish. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For those of you that are saved today, for those of you that know without a shadow of a doubt you've been saved to the uttermost, you ought to pray for those here in this service that ain't. And you ought to ask the Lord to convict them and do a work inside of them only He can do. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 14, it says this, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which in, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Notice, For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Notice, Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. Notice, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. To the uttermost. When I got saved to the uttermost, you know what that means? That means that the Lord by His grace recruited me for the uttermost. There's people in every alley, in every street corner, all over this entire world that stands in desperate need of somebody to witness to them the gospel of Jesus Christ and what He can do for them. Amen, amen, amen right there. Amen goes right there. You've been recruited to witness to a lost and dying world on the uttermost parts of the world. Not only were we recruited for that, but we will be rewarded to the uttermost. And by His grace, when I got saved, what that means is, is one of these days I'm going to get to go to heaven and I'm going to get to enjoy heaven and the uttermost part of it. But not only did I get saved, and not only did I get the reward to the uttermost, but I was rescued from the uttermost. There's an uttermost that is on the opposite side of the spectrum of eternity. Please re re realize this this morning. I need everybody to pay attention. Hell was made and was created by God. And just as vast and just as glorious as heaven is, hell is just as vast and just as terrible on the opposite side of the spectrum. He created it for Satan and his angels. And Satan and his angels are doing everything they can to try to hinder every single breathing human being that's alive and that's ever lived not to go to heaven, but to suffer in hell with the devil and with his angels for all of eternity. That's the purpose, that's the reason that God created hell. And that's the thing that drives Satan today. Is he wants nothing more than for you to miss out on heaven and spend eternity in hell. Hey, I said eternity in hell. We have such a small mind today and we have such a hard time grasping what the vastness of eternity really means. But by the grace of God, one of these days, for those of us that have been saved to the uttermost, we're going to get to experience the reward to the uttermost but I'm afraid that there's some today that have never been rescued from the uttermost parts of hell today. And the Bible tells us here that that place, that that place has been set aside and there's a people that's going to go there and they're going to experience this eternal wrath. They're going to experience this enormous, this extreme wrath and they'll never, hey, listen to the preacher this morning, they'll never escape the damnation the suffering, the torment, 
the agony, the absolute disdain for your cognition in the place that the Bible calls hell. And it's a real place. And it's a literal place. And for everybody that's never been saved, if you die in the shape that you're in, you will, you will, you will go to a place that's called hell. And that place is an eternal, extreme, and enormous place. I'm no scientist, never claimed to be. But sometimes I wonder if some of this global warming is due to the fact <coughs> of an expanding hell. You say global warming, what are you talking about? There are ice caps that are melting everywhere. And they can't explain why. They can't explain why. Let me tell you what I know. Hell hath enlarged itself. It's getting bigger. Why? Because it's filling up with people. And people are dying and they're going to hell. And they'd give anything to say something to you that would prevent you from going there. They'd give anything to be able to be you and not have to go to hell. It's a real, it's a real place. And people today look at death like it's just another choice, like it's just another event. It's a big deal. It's an enormous deal. And people are dying all the time. Without warning. Without a, without any, without any uh, uh, pre, uh, uh, pre-known uh, heads up of any kind. Just, I'm talking about just, just crossing over. No, look here, nothing that would cause them to think otherwise. A girl, I said, I thought she was younger than us, Brother Zach, but apparently we graduated with that girl. Heading down the road on 68 between Greensburg and and Campbellsville. It's a straight road. It's a straight road. It's not curvy. It's got a giant, uh, 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 whatever you call that, a median, whatever, on the side of the road. I mean, this is a nice, clean road, 68 from Greensburg to Campbellsville. And I'm talking about had a terrible car accident. And I'm talking about crossed over into eternity and left behind three little boys and a husband, 30 years of age. Had no reason to think when she got up that morning. Had no reason to think that she'd die. Had no reason to think that she wouldn't get to come home that day and get to love on them babies and love on that husband. But by the, look here, but by the uh, uh, all-knowing omniscience of God, she crossed over into eternity. And you're sitting here in this place today and you're thinking, I'm going to enjoy what I want. I'm going to have pleasure in this sin. I'm going to get all of it that I want. I don't care what Brother Caleb says. I'm going to enjoy what's mine. I'm going to do what I want to do. And there ain't nobody going to change that. Well, one of these days, I hope to God you never experience the uttermost part of hell. I hope to God you never experience the uttermost wrath that is and will come to those who refuse the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, my mama say, Brother Caleb, that ought to be enough. That ain't enough. My daddy say, Brother Caleb, they, they go to church, they bring me here to this church, Brother. Hey, everybody here thinks I'm saved. That ought to be enough. It sure would be a shame for you to go to hell out of being ashamed and embarrassed of admitting you're lost. What a prideful, what a prideful thing. What a terrible, prideful, and ungodly thing to get in the way of you trusting in Jesus as your Savior. We're talking about hell this morning and the reality of it. And the uttermost part of it. And the uttermost wrath that is in it. Well, I'm thankful that when I got saved, I got saved to the uttermost. That means I got rescued from the uttermost too. Amen. 
Boy, it's more than I thought I was getting. Can I just say that real quick? I'm trying to get done. But when I got saved, I got so much exceeding and abundant more than I ever thought I would. Well, I was just trying to escape the uttermost wrath that was to come in hell. But what I didn't know was the uttermost reward that come through and by the gospel. Boy, I just thank God this is the best life you could ever live. Hey, we still experience storms. We still experience hard times. There's days that are so hard we don't know how to go to sleep at night. But by the grace of an almighty God, there's an uttermost salvation that settles in on me, that stirs inside of me, that gives me that Holy Spirit of God that rejuvenates me and reminds me that it's all going to be all right. Well, I'm thankful he knows what's best this morning. It'd be a shame for somebody to leave today and not know without a shadow of a doubt that they've been saved. To the uttermost. Let's stand to our feet. Brother Beckham, why don't you come? <coughs> if you can't say without a shadow of a doubt that you've been saved to the uttermost, you ought to just go ahead and step out of your pew right now. If you can't say without a shadow of a doubt that your kids are saved to the uttermost, you ought to just step out of your pew right now. If you can't say without a shadow of a doubt, that you know without a shadow of a doubt that your entire family has been saved to the uttermost. You ought to just step out of your pew right now. Come down to this altar and just spend some time praying today. We need some people that realize the real nature of salvation and the need to be saved. Salvation is just as real as I'm standing here today. And if you've never, if you've never put your faith in Him, hey, I'm talking about truly put your faith in Jesus, then you can't say without a doubt that you've been saved to the uttermost. And if it's not real, I'm talking about real today, then you'd be crazy to leave and die lost and go to hell. We've got some people praying today and they're burdened for lost souls. And they're burdened for folk that stand in need of salvation. Maybe you're here and you've got some lost family. Maybe you've got some lost loved ones. I'd strongly urge you. Spend some time praying. And ask the Lord to save you today. Save them. And change their life.